to really start to talk to him about where his food comes from. Um, he, he's really not home a lot when I'm cooking stuff, so a lot of times he gets home from school and, and dinner is partly made and he doesn't really help me out that much. So I started to make a change and say, you know, Jack, do you want to help me cook the dinner, prepare the dinner, come to the market, let's pick stuff out. So he went on this field trip to a farm. He came home and he was all excited and he said, Mom, I know where carrots come from. And I said, Mom, this is great. Where do carrots come from? And he said, the carrot machine. So apparently at the farm, the carrots slide down this machine and get them back. So, you know, even as somebody who works in this field, I haven't done everything 100% correct. Um, it's hard to be a role model. It's, 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 you know, it's hard to, to do that, but parents have to understand that when they are drinking soda at the dinner table and their child asks for soda and you say, no, you can't have it, you're... It's, it's a difficult message for a kid that, you know, you can have it because you're an adult, I can't have it because I'm a kid. And kids want to be like their parents, you know, they want to emulate those things. So, switching to healthier beverages or healthier beverages, <coughs> or like you said, not having to pack up the snack bag for a 20-minute ride, goes a long way. And I think um, another thing is parents have to really remain confident that they're doing the right thing because when you're in the supermarket and, you know, like my son, he's saying, I want the SpongeBob SquarePants fruit snacks. And I'm like, how do you know what SpongeBob SquarePants is? And how do you know what fruit snacks are? And then I look down and there's, you know, this big display right at his eye level, right where he is. SpongeBob SquarePants fruit snacks made with real fruit in them. I don't really know what they do to the food. But, um, it's, it's really hard, you, you know. And that issue um, that somebody brought up earlier about show them love without food, it's hard. I've been at the office all day, and this is, you know, our, our one time together, and my son is asking for something, and I want to give him what he wants, but that's not the best option for him. And everyone's got a cave sometimes, I cave. Um, but I think it's hard as parents, especially when you're bombarded with all of this unhealthy messaging, to say, I'm doing what's right, you know, I'm doing what's good, I'm going to stick to my guns, and I'm going to instead go home and spend 20 minutes outside playing with you or, or doing an activity together instead of this thing that you're asking for. And I think as a community, um, just back to that issue of, you know, all kind of working together and making sure that wherever our kids go, they're faced with a healthy option instead of the unhealthy option. So when they go to that child care center, they're serving something good. When they go to that school, they're serving something good. And then when they come home, they're serving something healthy. And also the school issue is the activity as well. So, an awful lot has been put into play at every level of our, of our communities, national, state, and local. Lots of programs, lots of, lots of efforts to come at this, this childhood obesity epidemic. I'd like to ask our panelists, each in their area of expertise, if they would name one promising sign, program, or initiative that they believe is going to have a positive effect to reverse or correct the problem of childhood obesity. Maybe we'll just sort of unroll the panel in the opposite direction. Eliza, start with you. Sure. Um, in this one, I have to kind of refer to notes here because I have some, some figures that I wanted to share with you. So one of the things that I've seen working at the State Health Department, um, our program is federally funded. We've been around for a pretty long time. Before this program, I worked in other federally funded physical activity and nutrition programs. And the focus of the programs years ago was more around, all right, we have an obese child, a child with a weight problem, we need to fix it. The shift has kind of moved towards, let's work on this problem before the child has a weight problem. Let's work on the physical activity and nutrition habits. And now what I'm seeing is even a step back from that and let's work on the environment where the kid is, is situated so that they don't get into an issue around physical activity and nutrition. So there's been a couple of things that's happened at the federal level. Really a shift towards federal funding that is going more towards primary prevention of overweight and obesity. Um, and I don't know how familiar you guys are with the federal funding stuff that's been happening, but the amount of money that has been put towards physical activity and nutrition and changing the environment has been huge. So just as a <coughs> um, the really big examples, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009 had the Communities Putting Prevention to Work program that put about $600 million into states and communities. And the focus of that was around sustainable policy and environmental changes. 
So um, looking at things like, are the streets safe so kids, are the neighborhoods safe so kids can go outside and play? Do child care centers have the ability to offer healthier foods? Do schools have kitchens to be able to prepare foods? So some of those issues. Um, the Healthy Food Financing Initiative, uh, under President Obama, put $400 million towards <coughs> what's really considered economic development and community redevelopment projects with a focus on food. So what these projects are doing is um, they're investing money in communities to, to, um, towards economic development, but the focus is on making sure that healthy foods are available to people who live in those communities. And then the um, newest thing, the Community Transformation Grants, that's about $100 million. That's, again, going towards community policy changes. But this one also incorporates a linkage with the healthcare system. And I think that's been a piece that's kind of been missing most recently with some of these policy and environmental change projects is that they haven't really been connected to the healthcare setting. So the Community Transformation Grant is looking to kind of connect those. So I think, um, for me, it's a sign that we're really shifting towards less of the treatment. We still need the treatment. We still have a you know, growing number of overweight and obese kids out there. But we're looking more at how are we going to fix this problem before it starts. And a lot of the investment is, is uh, shifting towards that. Thank you. Frank? Uh, well, as I'm in the, in the food business, uh, I don't get a chance to work in many schools. I know the Kids First program has always been very effective. Uh, just moved to school started, but that kind of that started by the Obama administration. I've like seen that kind of peter out a little bit. And to get from you got to start it, it had to be done at a young age. You have to get them in the, in the elementary schools. Uh, I know in high schools they used to, I don't know they call them home economic classes anymore. Uh, they used to, that's kind of a term that's kind of scary. Uh, if they use a boot program, I think it's a lot better. You're going to see more and you're going to see more males getting into that. Um, but you have to start them off at an early level. You've got to get them into the um, elementary schools. I know going out to visit a farm on a field trip can be difficult sometimes because now it becomes a, it becomes a case of economics, it becomes a case of legal issues, and so forth. But they actually bring, you know, the farmers come in, they do it at the Orchard Farm School on Situate Avenue. You go by there in the summertime, it's 11, you go by there in the fall, you can't see the school because the corn blocks the school. And the, the farmer plants the corn, lets the kids go running through there, pick the corn, the corn is taken into the kitchen, and then it's used as, as, as part of a school lunch program, which is unique. Uh, you probably don't see too many of those around, but I, I firmly believe that to get them, you have to get them at an early age. Uh, I mentor a lot of kids, mostly high school seniors as part of a project. I also have four kids that I, I've had them as young as 11 years old spend a day in my kitchen at school. We have the opportunity to do that. They, the parents contact me, they come in, they get them a lab coat, a chef hat. We don't give, we don't give them any knives, but they walk around, they talk to the <laughs> Well, I mean, with that insurance regulation to deal with. And um, it's interesting, I've got one kid down that comes all the time, uh, a young girl, she's 12 years old now, and she spends the day in the kitchen and she knows everything about every vegetable. You can throw anything out of the refrigerator, she knows that every single thing is. And it's great, she picked this up in elementary school. Uh, at a younger age. Now she's in middle school. So these programs should be enacted in it. Now, if the government's going to spend all this money, uh, they should spend the money and put them into some of these schools at an early age. You know, a kid doesn't learn two and two when they're in the tenth grade. They learn when they're in the first grade. Uh, so they have to stop at that level. I, I, that's my personal opinion. Thank you. Dorothy. Okay. Um, I'm going to try to be brief. Um, I think one So the most promising practice, the most promising um, thing that we found working every possible angle in the school to get schools to adopt policy, but also to implement, monitor, and improve their environment um, as shaped by that policy is, is really difficult. Um, how do you get a community wrapped around change? And it really has been change of the environment. Whenever you talk about change, it makes folks very nervous because uh, it's going to change their world. They've got to do something different and, oh my God, it's going to be too hard. Or, you know, I really like my Cocoa Puffs and I don't want them to go away. You know, it's, the superintendent might have that problem. Um, so, um, so getting folks to change, how do you get them to change and wrap around healthy food? And that really has been our experience. Um, 
We have found that getting folks actively engaged in food, hands on, mouths on, minds on, with food again, has, has really changed the way communities view food. Um, that cornfield in Cranston took a long time. Um, that community had been disconnected with farming and agriculture. And I went to the early meetings, um, and we were, we were just talking about this, uh, I went to the early meetings uh, about possibly not blacktopping that entire area and instead letting it be a cornfield. And parents were at the meeting um, fighting it, and their reasons for fighting it really d disturbed me, almost scared me. Um, they thought we'd have migrant workers in that field using the bathrooms. They thought we'd have rats in the school because there was corn growing 